welcome to the 10th episode of Conquering the Glass Ceiling with Dr. Courtney, the show dedicated to inspiring and empowering female entrepreneurs to live confidently and move confidently into their worth and their their value. Do you want to know how to share your message with the media, with the world, and not sure how? Well, up next, we're going to talk to a female entrepreneur who has done just that, and she has an incredible story, and I can't wait to share it with you. I'm your host, Dr. Courtney, and I believe when women are empowered to live confidently in their worth and their value, we will truly achieve gender equality. And are you a female entrepreneur looking to for motivation and inspiration to build your business and not sure how? Well, you found the right spot. I have grown my amazing company from just a tiny investment into a multi-million dollar enterprise, and I want to help you do the same. Conquering the glass ceiling will not only empower you and inspire you, but each week we will bring you amazing women entrepreneurs who have walked the road and who have found their worth and their confidence through sharing their stories and growing their businesses and found amazing success. And I would really love it if you would share the episodes and subscribe and rate, rate, rate and review. And in a moment, we're going to be joined with Melissa Jesperson Moore, who is an executive producer at CNN and for the Dr. Oz Show. She is the author of Shattered Silence, a friend of mine, which bonus. That's incredible. And an overall amazing person. Melissa is going to share with us, one, how to craft your message into a book, a compelling book, and two, how to take that message and share it with others to inspire millions of people. And three, how to battle that inner voice that says, who does she think she is? And uh, face that internal and external criticism and conquer anyway. So we're going to be joining with her next. Oh, my gosh. I forgot to say thank you to my sponsor, who's not really my sponsor because they don't know it yet. Whataburger. So first, we're going to uh, talk to Melissa Jesperson Moore, who is an incredible person. She's an amazing friend of mine, and she has gone down the journey that so many people that I talk to want to go on, and I can't wait to share her story with her and for you to hear how she has been able to conquer the glass ceiling and determine success in her own right. Melissa, how are you? Good. Good morning. <laughs> Pretty early here. Oh, I, you know, you're a great friend. Only you would get me up this early. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And you look incredible for bright and shiny. She is in California. So thank you for joining us at 8 a.m. your time. But Melissa is global. Like she, anytime I text her, I'm going, where in the world are you? And is it four in the morning? I'm so sorry. It's fine. Sometimes I wake up and I don't even know where I'm at. <laughs> it happened. It just happened just recently. I was. I woke up in Spokane, Washington. Uh, where am I? I, I <laughs> and then it took me a couple seconds, and I realized, oh, this is where I'm at. This is why I'm here. <laughs> That's awesome, and I love it because I'm always like, okay, hashtag real world problems. Where in the world is Melissa Moore right now? Yeah, well, and I'm excited because um, I'm going to Morocco in August for a retreat that I've crafted for women entrepreneurs. Oh, so incredible. And I can't wait to talk about that. And also like your your book launch that you have to support other women entrepreneurs. But first, let's talk about you. Okay. What do you what do you do when you felt empowered to call? First, let's start. How'd you get to be Melissa Jesperson Moore, amazing entrepreneur and CNN executive producer and Dr. Oz correspondent? Well, I think this is where you and I connected really well is that we weren't always this successful. We mm -hmm. both didn't just start out off having multimillionaire, you know, multi million dollar companies. We started off at the ground level and we built it up to be the success that it is. So I actually started off on welfare. Um, I 
I grew up in what they call felony flats in Spokane, Washington. And it, it they call it felony flats because it's right next to the jail. And when they release the, the inmates and they kind of nestle in these halfway houses where I grew up. So that it, it was an interesting, it was interesting because I think it prepared me living in those hard conditions, I think prepared me for what it takes to be successful. Uh -huh. But um, not only that, so in 1995, for those who aren't familiar with my story, uh, my father was incarcerated. And so we lost all the child support income from that. But it, and I mean, that's a, another story for, it's a big story for another day, but uh, I had a lot of obstacles. And so when my father was arrested, I continued to go forward and I got my high school education. I graduated and then I went to college, just a two year degree. And then from there, I just, I've always wanted better for myself. And I think a lot of your viewers and listeners, they want the same for themselves and they just don't know how to do it. And that's where I used to be. So I'm happy to, you know, explain how I did it and, and show them that anything's possible. If I could come from felony flats and live in this beautiful Southern California, place and, and make this uh, company that I did, then anybody can. And that's what I love about you is that you have not forgotten your roots. I know that we've talked about how, you know, I had my, <laughs> what I call my, my high school souvenir six months after I graduated from high school and um, I was on welfare. I was on Medicaid and I was on food stamps and I knew that I wanted better. And that's what I think connected us as well is just that ability to stay really connected to your roots, but know that you deserve more, that you are um, writing that your legacy for yourself and your family every single day. Well, what's interesting too, and this is what saddens me is that it's easy when, when you have a frame of reference and the ceiling is, is down here and you see all these people living this, what it looks like the high life, and you just know it's only possible for you to reach this little ceiling, it's discouraging. And that's what saddens me is that I see people live below their level. They don't know what's possible for them, that when they see people living up here, it's just as possible for them as for anybody. Mm -hmm. So um, if anybody could be living the life that they choose, then, then they can live it. Right. So what do you do when you are feel when you feel compelled to share your story, but you don't know how? Yeah. So I feel like everybody has a message and that everybody has a talent and it's just cultivating that that calling that message and crafting it in a way where the media can pay attention. And it normally comes in the form of sound bites or just being able to get your message across in a very concise and direct way. And a lot of people, I think they get mixed up and they think I'm going to tell my story and this is what I went through. Whereas they should be thinking, how does my story relate to other people? How can I serve other people with my story versus the perspective of coming from like, I want to share my story. And then the viewers and the listeners are just going to be you know, active, like non-active participants, and they're going to sit there and just listen to me. That never works. If you have the intention of what do I have, what's in my message that I can share mm -hmm. then, and this would end my message. It would make other people's lives better. That's how you have to, you know, go about it. Share a little bit of your story about how you went from, this was my experience and I'm going to, um, go out on a limb and, and I don't want to tell it because I want you to tell your story of how you got to being where you are today. I'm trying to think of where I should start. Um, <laughs> maybe I should start. You already know where my, my roots, you know, the felony flat. So mm -hmm. jump ahead. I graduated from high school. I got married and I desire to own a home. And I remember that was a a big thing for me. I wanted stability in my life. And if anybody, you know, had a transient lifestyle where they lived in cars or they had nothing, home is, is something that is a luxury. I think everybody has their own what's a luxury, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, home ownership was really important. And so I decided like, well, how can I make this happen? And first of all, I think you have to get really clear on what exactly you want. I knew exactly that I wanted a beautiful home to raise my two children in and give them the lifestyle that I didn't have. So I started looking at homes 
and I didn't even know how to get a loan. I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't even know if I could qualify for a loan. <laughs> and I started to see the range, the price range of the homes I wanted, which were above my means. And so where there's will, there's a way they say that, right? right. But the universe that feels like, or God, whoever you want to call that force is that I believe when you make bold decisions, you're rapidly supported and the right people come into your life and the knowledge will just be downloaded to you, whether through meditation or through prayer, you'll get the inspiration to make, to make that next step. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, Courtney, we, you never know the full, the full picture. You, there's always uncertainty when you're moving in the direction that you're supposed to go in your life. Absolutely. You never know the whole picture, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's what I found to be a big part of finding success is that I think people need to see the full picture before they even start, but that's where they go wrong is you have to just take the first inspired step. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I'm just going back to the house and wanting to own a home. That's what I did is that I, I made that decision. And so I got this inspiration one day when I started seeing all my friends hurt their kids off to daycare and they were so dis, you know, disappointed and, and the options that were available. And so I thought, what if I open an in-house daycare center? How much revenue can I make? And, and how does that work? How can I serve my friends? And how can I serve myself by being able to stay at home with my children? And so once I started investigating that, I found I can do the child care center at home. I got licensed and I bought the house and I was able to carry the mortgage because of that. Uh -huh. But that was just step, you know, the next step. From there in 2008, um, my daughter wanted to know like how, you know, she was doing the family tree. Mm -hmm. And as you know, when kids fill out those, those family trees, they know all their relatives, but my daughter didn't know who her grandfather is on my side of the family. Mm -hmm. So there was a blank hole there. And so when she came home, she was really excited to talk about how we're all connected in this big family tree, but she didn't know who my dad was. Mm -hmm. And that was on purpose. I didn't want her to know who her grandfather was because he's an infamous, horrible, horrible man. He's, um, he's serving multiple life sentences in prison. And so I just didn't want her to know about him. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, he lives in Salem and I gave her the name. But that led me on a quest. I was unsettled from that moment and I realized, I don't know, how am I gonna find out the answers on how to tell my precious little girl about this horrible man that she's related to? Because there is a stigma associated with people who are incarcerated. It's like guilty by association. Right. I didn't want her to have that. Mm -hmm. So like I had it. It was a big secret in my life. Mm -hmm. And so for me, a lot of the childcare parents, my clients, they had no knowledge of who I was related to. Uh -huh. And I was afraid that if they knew who, was our, who I was related to, that they would think I'm a horrible person and that I wouldn't take care of their children. You know, I thought I was gonna lose my business, mm -hmm. but I was at this crossroads. And I think that's an important place that we all go through. There's this threshold. And if you wanna cross that threshold, there's that uncertainty and fear. And for me, it was, I'm gonna lose all my clients. I'm gonna lose my beautiful home. I'm gonna lose everything if I come forward with my story. And I didn't, it, it was a massive risk. So I decided to go ahead and go forward and tell my story. I wrote into a producer at the Dr. Phil show mm -hmm. and I explained my situation and they invited me on to go and meet with Dr. Phil and I had to make that decision. Not only was it gonna impact my, my business, my home life, it was also gonna impact my, at my husband at the time his business, he was corporate with UPS mm -hmm. and nobody knew who he was married to and who his wife was related to and how would that impact his business? We had stock, we had, we built a comfortable life and we could have lost it all. So I appreciated him for supporting me and making my decision to go public with my story. So when I went on the Dr. Phil show- But wait, I, what oh, courage. <laughs> Oh my God, what courage you had to just take that le le leap of faith and not only write in, but go on the yeah, show. Yeah, Courtney, I wish I could explain the level of fear in my life. I mean, I was petrified. Mm -hmm. Everything was on the line, everything, everything. Uh -huh. But I felt it was important to go forward and find the answers to my questions about how can I help my daughter? How can I help myself to get over this? Mm -hmm. And I, I made the decision to go and it wasn't, I didn't know what was going to happen when it aired. I was so sick to my stomach. 
I really didn't know what was going to happen. And Dr. Phil is one of the largest rated shows still to this day. I mm -hmm. think the average rater, uh, average amount of um, viewers is 6 million. Mm -hmm. And to this day, by the way, I have people contact me who know me from that original recording, wow. that original segment. Yeah. So it surprises me how, you know, Dr. Phil uh, viewers, how they watch every episode that they're tuned in and they get invested in the, in the people on the show. Mm -hmm. So, but it was essentially, it was letting out my giant secret and I had so much shame around it. And I think that's a big part of women or, or men who want to share their story, but they've gone through massive trauma. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to, to tell the story because what, what, if I share my story, what about the people who hurt me? Other people are going to know that was the person who hurt me. And how do I, you kind of want to protect the guilty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of nuts that way, but uh -huh. you, do, you feel like you, you feel a lot of shame. And then you feel like, what if, you know, I'm going to impact these other people's lives. What do I do? Yeah. And, yeah. and the rejection, you know, who is not afraid of rejection? Right. Mm-hmm. So, and I was afraid of a massive scale rejection because if I come forward with my story, you know, getting rejected by my clients, mm -hmm. uh, getting rejected with my husband's work, but also I had, I was very active in a church at the time. All of my social networks were tied to this church. And what if they judge me and they, they think I'm not, you know, yeah, can't, shouldn't belong in their church. Yeah. And, you know, at this point, I would say that um, I reached, if I would have just stayed at that level, I had my own house, I had a thriving business, I wasn't making seven figures, I was probably, like, I was just under six figures supporting my life. And that's pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, a comfortable life. My kids were going to nice schools, I drove a nice car, I, you know, I had a Land Rover. I, I, I made a really good middle class income for myself. Mm -hmm. And that could have all gone away. And I could have gone back to poverty. It was what was my fear. Yeah. That financial stability is, was really important to me too. But what I think is amazing is that you took that leap and you have had massive success as a result of it. So you could have let mediocre, not, I don't want to say mediocrity, but comfort. Yeah. Comfort is the yeah, right word. Comfort. Yeah. Um, dictate your life. And you knew that freedom was in sharing your message. Oh, so, no, I didn't know where, I had no idea Freedom for you, where, though, where, for yes. feeling that, oh, my God, this is out now. Yes. I can relief. exhale. But you know what? That's when, when you up-level your life or you become visible, I think a lot of people don't want to become visible or share their message because what about the criticism I'll receive? What about mm -hmm. the naysayers, the people who have negative things to say? Because what you said just earlier is it's not it's not a good thing to be rejected. It's a horrible feeling. Mm -hmm. I think it really blocks people from going forward is that fear of rejection. And what if the people around me reject me if I tell my story? Or what if the people out there don't respond to my story the way I hope they would respond? Mm -hmm. you know? So you go on Dr. Phil, and, and then what happens? And then it airs. <laughs> <laughs> and you pull the covers over your head. <laughs> you pull the covers over your head and you say, oh, God, please let the world go away. And I was just thinking, like, where can I hide when it airs? And then how do I avoid people? <sighs> How do I not look people, you know, like walk in the supermarket and eyes? Yeah. <laughs> you don't know who saw it. Every, uh -huh. you know, it just was, it was terrifying. Well, and it's so funny you say that because like if you're in the Walmart or Kroger or whatever and you see someone turn around, you're like, oh my God, they saw it. They rejected me. And they're like, no, I really just wanted Cheerios. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. I would turn around and I would have this paranoia. I was uh -huh. afraid like. The people standing next to me in the supermarket saw the segment. What do they think? <laughs> <laughs> what was the backlash going to be? And then I was pleasantly surprised. Oh. All of a sudden, it's very much like the Me Too movement. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, I got a lot of women and men, but mostly women, coming to me and emailing me, tracking me down, saying, Me Too. Mm -hmm. You know, and they didn't relate. Some of them didn't relate to, you know, my father 
who he is, you know, that, that scale of, um, evil, but mm -hmm. they related to the same feelings of shame. Yeah. And that's where our, my connection was, to, you know, was to them and, um, were to them, but it was, but it was a mass, like you said, it just took a lot of courage to do that. And that's where I feel like I'm really good at helping women make that, that step, that risk in telling their story because I walk that same path. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you've had your, your fears as well that could have stopped you. Yeah. Yeah. So you go on and it airs and, yeah. and, and then what happens? I got a massive outreach from people uh -huh. saying, you know, me too. Uh -huh. And then all these stories started flooding in and I just didn't think that I could have inspired millions of people and what that feels like to inspire millions. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about bigger than I could have ever dreamed. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what I feel like is so amazing with the media is that it's a, a really great tool. Just like with your podcast is you mm -hmm. never know who's watching at the moment, who's listening at the moment, who needs to hear that message, yeah. a message of only you can share into the world. Mm -hmm. And so I find that, that, um, breaking that barrier because with you know, where you're local, if you're, you're sharing your so -called, your story local at a church, you're maybe impacting 50 to 100 people. But the odds, you know, if it's a ratio of how many people needed to hear that story, it's going to be a lower ratio mm -hmm. be just because of a, it's a sure numbers game. You don't know who needs to hear your story. And I've had people who needed to hear my story all the way in Belgium. Wow. You just don't know. Mm -hmm. You just don't know who needs to hear your story. So why limit yourself? to being local. Right. So you hear all this, this affirmation of, oh my gosh, me too, mm -hmm. and realize your impact. So what do you do with that? Well, then I realized that there's a lot of women and men who feel the way that I felt, mm -hmm. just terrified to become visible. And then I realized it's exactly what we just talked about is that fear of rejection or, you know, who does she think she is? Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. Like sometimes it's just within ourselves. We're the ones saying, who do I think I am? Like, right. who am I to go out there and tell my story? Like, it's just my little old story. And there's a million other girls or women out there that have gone through what I've gone through. And why would my story make a difference? I'm not that unique. And, you know, you can have this internal negative tape, but you just don't know. I mean, there's, if you think about it for yourself, you, you know that every time you hear another story, it validates your experience. And Absolutely. so just because your story has similar ties or themes to other people's story doesn't mean that it's not as important. Right. So how did you move into becoming a Dr. Oz correspondent and on CNN and and being Melissa Moore. So I gathered all these stories of people who went through something similar to what I've been through. And I started thinking, how do I share their stories? Because it was so therapeutic and such a relief for me to share mine to the world. And then to have that influence felt so good. And when you go through something senseless, how do you create meaning in your life? You you want to create meaning by sharing it and helping others so that you, you know, the meaningless becomes meaningful. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I love helping women and men do is, is take their story, their message, and especially if it's trauma related or they've gone through a massive amount of adversity, which a lot of people sadly have, mm -hmm. it's just helping them craft their story so they can inspire millions and get it out there and, and help the world. And so what I started to do is, is create a TV show a series and I didn't know how to create a TV show, but I did. I, I started writing out uh, what's called a, um, a treatment, a TV treatment. And I crafted out what the format was. I didn't know anything. I just started researching. I was going to say, did, was Googler your best friend? Google is my best friend. <laughs> like you can find anything on Google. And then, but like, just like I said earlier, like where there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. The universe comes and supports you. So I had this vision in my mind. I had a vision board too. And I knew I wanted to get these people's story out into the world. And I knew how I wanted to, and that was through a TV series. I just didn't have the connections in LA. I mean, I was living in Spokane, Washington, uh -huh. like way far away from Los Angeles um, or New York where the, you know, most TV shows are pitched. And so 
I got contacted by a production company out of the blue one day and they're like, we think you, you know, we think that you could create a TV series. I'm like, yeah, I, I believe that as well. And they're like, what do you want to create? I'm like, actually, here it is. And so they. Amazing. Opt- <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. So they optioned my TV series and I created it. It took three years mm-hmm. to get it bought um, by a network and Lifetime Movie Network bought it. And um, it was so exciting. And I learned so much. I actually was camera shy. I was petrified of the camera. Wow. And and I had to get over that real fast. <laughs> I was going to be on TV as a TV host, you know. Uh-huh. Um, what was intimidating about the camera was perfection. I was afraid, like, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I look silly? What if, you know, what if, what if? Mm-hmm. And what's amazing about uh, media is that it wasn't live. They edit it. And mm-hmm. so you could just be yourself and they take the ums out. They take any awkward things out and, and it becomes this perfect masterpiece. But also there's a beauty in, in just being live and just sharing who you are. I mean, unapologetically, this is yeah. just who I am. And at, at the end of the day, I'm really happy with who I am. So if I'm happy with who I am, then then I guess it doesn't matter what other people think. And that's what helped me get over my camera shyness. Mm-hmm. So you launched this TV show and yeah. Oh my gosh, what an incredible experience. And then to move from that to where you are now, I just, I think the biggest thing is so, because I know your journey and I think, I mean, and obviously you know your journey, but when you are so close to it, you don't realize, and and you, especially, I don't think realize how incredible, you don't know how incredible you are, Melissa. So I want to share it with others, just how amazing your journey is and but you're so real. And I love that. Oh, I love it. So well, how- then, so like what I was saying earlier is you just, you take that inspired first step and then the next inspired step comes along. And so I launched this TV series. It was, I believe I got eight episodes and it went out into the world. And then, you know, I got a lot of media opportunities, but then I still desire to share other people's stories and Then I got invited to go on the Dr. Oz show to be a guest. I was not a correspondent. I was just purely a guest sharing my story. And they said, you did a fantastic job. Do you have any other stories you want to share? I was like, absolutely. (laughs) Let me go get my book. (laughs) Yeah. I have so many people who reach out to me that want to share their story. I love to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And so I got a freelance agreement where I would procure stories that I thought were amazing and help them share it on the Dr. Oz show. And there was, you know, it was not a salary. It was not a lot of money. It was just, it was just the joy of helping people get on the Dr. Oz show and share their story. And so when that happened, um, they were having, it was, it was rating wells. It was successful. And so then they offered me a six month contract and it was still way below any kind of income you would think in TV. Mm-hmm. And it, and then um, that was massively successful. And so they offered me a, a season one and then a season two and now I'm on season three. And I love it. And I learned so much. Every season I learned how to be a better and better storyteller. Uh-huh. So tell us, How do you share your message with the media so they will listen? Yeah, first of all, it's just being clear on who needs to hear your story. Mm -hmm. What type of people need to hear your story? So when I crafted, I wrote two books. I wrote Shattered Silence back in 2008, right after the Dr. Phil show aired. I decided I'm going to just share my journey in a memoir. And and then again, I battled that that talk, like, who who do you think you are? Like, who's going to read your story, are they going to, you know, is this going to be a pity party book? (laughs) Yeah. For me, wow. (laughs) Nobody needs to hear that. So I try to think about what would people get out of my message. And so I crafted my memoir to be leading people in the intention of what, how this can serve their life. And so that I did that. It was massively successful promoting people magazine. It was, it's launched across the world in many different languages and, um, and Oprah read it. I should say that Oprah yeah. read, um, I'll go back to, can I just share the Oprah story? Please. 
I, I was trying to lead you there, and that's what I mean. You are too Sorry, close. I forgot about Oprah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry about her. Dr. Oz, how did I become a Dr. Oz correspondent? Okay. <laughs> Let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's early. That was a big part of my journey, too. So yeah. going back to 2008 when I you know, I did the Dr. Phil show, and, and then I was battling this thought – like who am I to share my story even more, but I was inspired by the outreach of people towards me. And so I decided to craft my memoir. I did. And when it wasn't even finished, um, I had the intention as a lot of authors do that they want Oprah to, you know, be sitting across the couch and have her read your story or share your story to the world. And so I had that vision in my head, but I was certain it was going to happen. I believed that it could, it could happen. And a lot of people said, nah, Good luck with that. Even my publisher was like, good luck with that. <laughs> so uh, so what I did was that I went on to Twitter and I followed not just Oprah, but I followed all of her producers. And a lot of people don't understand the hierarchy in the media world of like who associate producers are, executive mm -hmm. producers are, booking uh, editors, who, you know, who is who in this media world. Because if you just reach out to Oprah herself, she doesn't read all her tweets. You have to go to the right. show. She's a little know. busy. Yeah. So I reached, I started following producers of the show. And one night, I think it was 10 o'clock at night, one of the main um, supervising producers posted on Twitter, hey, we're getting ready for season nine. I think, it, no, not season nine, it was season 20 oh, season 24 because it was the season right before her last season mm. and they were looking for some stories and they just did this kind of outreach tweet they're like message me if you believe you have a story to tell and i remember telling my husband at the time well that's not how you're supposed to do it he's like you should tweet back and share your story i'm like no that's not how you do it that's so unprofessional <laughs> For me to tweet my story, like, how am I going to do that? What, like, no, I had to create a press release and a reel. And in my mind, it had to be something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we get, you know, a little caught up. All of us do is just it's supposed to look a certain way. Let me put the bow on it and then yeah. send you the gift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not how it works. Sometimes it's just messy and raw. And mm -hmm. so I, he said, you, you know, if you're not going to tweet her, I am. So he tweeted her. And shared my story and they're like for real and, they're, and he's like yeah and they're like let's make a let's make a call and so i got a call from the oprah producers and they're like well where are you at with your book and i'm like well actually it's it's just you know going through the last editing stage it's not even finished and and they're like we'll send it over so i sent it over this unpolished uh galley and um Oprah took it on that, that summer, she, Oprah was taking all of her producers on a cruise uh, in Europe. And so Oprah read my book over on that cruise and invited me on. And, and, but I remember we taped um, in Chicago at Harpo Studios uh -huh. on August 27th. And it was a date that I remember because up until that point, everybody said, don't get your hopes up. You can be moved and pushed aside if another story comes along, you could be dropped. And it's very true. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing what I know in the media is that you never know if breaking news is going to happen or a story, a prominent story rises in the media. And they're just like, you know, just be prepared that you're not going to end up on Oprah. Your book's not going to end up on Oprah because you're going to get kicked off. And I refuse to believe that. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't listen to what they said. And, and it was easy to have that doubt. It really could have been easy to have that doubt. Mm -hmm. But it takes, you know, it does take more effort mentally, I think, to believe in, in the um, what seems like the impossible versus the realistic, you know, realistic things that could happen, mm -hmm. like not getting on Oprah. And so I just believed and I showed up on August 27th. I rolled into the studio and met Oprah for the first time. Oh, you and say that like there were multiple. It, she was, um, she was amazing. Uh -huh. And I loved how she just talked to her audience before we started rolling. Uh -huh. And she kicked off her, you know, her expensive red bottom shoes. <laughs> She's like, these are uncomfortable. <laughs> and she sat down and she grabbed my hand and she said, 
does a remarkable job with your book. Mm. And I wrote it all in the, um, in the journal she gave me. When I went to my dressing room after filming with her, I had all these gifts from her. I had this beautiful silk journal that was made in Africa. She had just gotten that school, uh -huh. you know, and was supporting her, her school for those young women. And um, she gave me a blanket with a with the O symbol. And then she gave me this beautiful like velvet um, PJ set with her like O emblem on it. Wow. So, yeah, I've never forgotten that, how gracious she was, how how elegant she is. I think that's why she relates to so many women is that she's living the life I think that we all desire. She has a, a very feminine approach to her work. And I think that's what works is if we just embrace our femininity and know that we don't have to hustle, that mm -hmm. we can be supported when we support each other as women, but just knowing that we're supported, we don't have to hustle. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think what you went through with all of the people who surrounded you that said, oh, don't get excited, don't get excited. You know, I'm sure she went through that too. And it was like, thanks for your advice or your opinion, but my purpose is bigger than this. And I'm gonna live into my purpose regardless if it's this time or next time or whenever it is, but I believe in my mission. Yeah, and they, who are they to know? Actually, yeah. who are they to know what you're calling and what, what the vision is for your life? They don't know. They're, it's not their business to know. Right. And I love what Oprah said, you know, God could dream a bigger dream than you can. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Yeah. It's absolutely true. Amazing. Yeah. So that was my Oprah experience. Uh -huh. And I have wonderful photos where she's hugging me. It's fun. And uh -huh. And I get to see her again because she comes on the Dr. Oz show often. And so I get to see her. Uh, that's why I said, and you say that like that was the only time. Like, there were multiple times. It's like, oh, yeah, Oprah. I forgot about her. Yeah, there was this lady I met. Her name was like Oprah or something. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's a powerhouse. And I, I love what she represents for women. And, and she's, you know, if you her approach has been absolutely spot on. And when she creates every segment or every episode of her shows or the movies she's crafted now, I mean, she has an empire, uh -huh. you know, media empire beyond merchandise and everything else. But mm -hmm. um, her, her intention is always, how does this serve other people? Mm -hmm. And if it's, if it doesn't serve other people, then it's just not worth it. You right. know, it well, and that's what I love about your heart is that you have the intention to serve others. So tell us how you are serving others right now if they have a story that they need to share. Yes, so I know when I first wrote uh, Shattered Silence, you know, I desired, I knew I had a book in me, I desired to write a book, and I don't know how, if you felt this way, Courtney, but it's a little daunting <laughs> to think about how am I going to write 60,000 words and how do I do this? I've ne when you've never done something before, it can seem overwhelming. Yeah, I was like, it. do the, do you do it on word? Like what, how do you do this? <laughs> Is there a special program I need to write a book in or? Well, then you have like these images of people going away, retreating from the world and typing in a cabin or yeah. <laughs> And we're busy moms who have jobs, we have lives. That yeah. doesn't happen. You're not going to get away. Yeah. If you can't even make time to exercise, how are you going to write a book? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Which is a non-necessity, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> or it feels like it. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I was, I was just, you know, I, I didn't know how this was going to work. And so what a lot of people don't know and what I wish I knew back then, is number one, is I wish I knew that you don't have to write the whole book. And mm -hmm. what happens is you just have to write a book proposal, which is about 30 pages. Mm -hmm. And that's where you really hone in on what it is your book is about. It's like a, it's like a roadmap or a business plan for your book. Mm -hmm. And with that um, book proposal, you take that and you pitch it to publishing houses. So even if you're worried about your whole book idea, you just send a sample and if they like the sample, you get a, what's called an advance and, and that will fund your book promotion and your book, your ability to write the book, I should say. Mm -hmm. So they'll pay you to write your book mm -hmm. if you create the book proposal. Okay. Yeah. And what are you doing to help people do that? Well, I like to sit down individually or in group settings. I like to find out what 
their story is and how does it matter? Like, why does it matter to other people? Mm -hmm. And I'm really, I think that's my talent is as a storyteller is finding what's the message that they have. And so I love to sit down and just look at their life story and pick out what those, those key things are. And then I help them draft their book proposal to go towards that intention, that message. And so it, it's really fun individual, like working individually one-on-one -on -one with women and men um, to help craft their book proposal. But there's something magical when you're in a group setting and you have other people there that have the same fears and struggles and they get to hear your ideas. And then they have these instant downloads and inspiration of how to make your idea better. So it's not just me, it's a group of people rallying. It's like a mastermind uh -huh. you know, for your book. And you're doing that. And it's fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so don't you have, you have that launching in July. Yeah. So in July, I'm doing a group course. I've done it in the past where I have all these workbooks created on how to create a book proposal and starting July 1st. We're going to start the, the we're going to start the group class again. And what what I do is I give the workbooks and homework, daily homework, and I keep them accountable. And then and it's really doable. Mm -hmm. It's like bite sized pieces on how to do this. And I and we do it for a month. And I check in once a week with everybody through a live Skype call or a live um, Facebook call or just Facebook Live. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> live on my private private Facebook group mm -hmm. and they can ask questions and, but I explain the homework for the following week and it's a good touchstone for everybody, but they have my support that way to okay. write their book proposal. So how does the audience get in touch with you or if they want to join this uh, mastermind, how do they do that? Well, if they just go to my Facebook profile and they message me or try to connect with me, then we can connect that way. Okay, great. Yeah. You have been amazing as always. I love our time together. Thank you so much for getting up early and putting makeup on. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, you own thing. I'm so proud of you, Courtney. You actually are inspiration to me. Oh. Yeah, you really are. I mean, your empire is fantastic. Like what you built, you're, you inspire me too. So well, I, I know you inspire if you inspire me, I know you inspire a lot of people. Well, you're, you are precious. Thank you so much. And I'm just, I am honored to be connected. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a fabulous day and we will talk soon. Sounds good. All right. Bye, Courtney. Bye. Hey guys, this is Courtney and I am with Mary Carmen and we are at Kids Care. And Mary Carmen, tell me what is your characteristic of your favorite boss? The best characteristic of your favorite boss? The best characteristic of my favorite boss is that, um, I'm not sure if it's a big characteristic, but she always has an open door policy. I can always find her if it's either through email, calling her, texting her. She's always quick to respond and, and tell me, yeah, I have a couple seconds and I can talk to her about the issues that I'm having um, here at work or sometimes even personal issues and she gives me advice and she's always uh, she always listens to me, so I just love that she has that open door policy with us. Open door policy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. No problem. I hope you have learned that the open door policy is perfect for building communication, removing the bottleneck, and also being approachable. And, and just like Melissa, just like you just saw, I mean, she is so approachable, and that is helps build stronger relationships to work together and really be a team. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Today has been awesome. And now you know what you need to do to get your story out into the world. And we all have our story that needs to be shared. And I would like to hear from you as a woman juggling, juggling the struggle juggle with a family and a career. What do you struggle with? Um, what do you need help with? Because I am here to help you. So email me at Courtney at CourtneyBaker.com and tell me if it's confidence. Tell me your, tell me your journey. If it's scaling your business, I'm here to help you. I've done it. I know. If it's clarity and focus, 
point, reach out to me. I'm so here to help you. Um, so email me at Courtney at CourtneyBaker.com. And if you like today's episode, please share it. Give me the thumbs up and subscribe. I'm happy to hear from you. Um, and I am so honored to spend the, the last hour with you. I will see you next week.